Okay. Um, I want to wanted to preface this episode and this discussion by saying that I wanted to do this episode. I had planned to do this episode on a later date, but clearly given the recent murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and the protests that are taking place right now, I'm recording this episode on June the 3rd. Um, obviously, I mean, it, it was time to, to, it was time to do the episode now. It's time to move that up. Um, that's kind of shameful as that is. Um, I've been complicit. I grew up in Berkeley, which is like the progressive liberal, uh, capital of the United States. It's a so-called liberal haven. And I hold those values dear to me. Um, my politics are liberal, but I haven't done shit. And it's shameful to me that it has taken me so long to speak out politically and to really feel the need to take action, take political action, for example. I mean, I wanted this podcast to be apolitical. I didn't want to talk about politics. I just wanted to talk about alcohol. Um, and I'm ashamed of that because I think recently we have seen, I mean, we have seen clear as day on video, the effects and results and ramifications of systematic racism and violence, namely towards black people and Latinos in the minority communities, namely towards black people. Um, and that's a difficult truth to swallow about one's self that I haven't done shit and I don't and I haven't actually stood for shit because I haven't done shit and it's clear as day that it's not it's not enough just to have the thoughts the actions are what count um a while back I went to see a play with my mom and this play was called White Noise. We saw it at Berkeley Rep. This was in uh, what was this in like November, and it's a play with four characters: a um, uh, white guy, white girl, black guy, black girl, who is who are in this friend group, and play, the the play starts out with this black character. I forget I forget his name, but apparently getting harassed and beaten up by the police. And he, of course, is distraught. It was, I guess, the first time that this had happened to him, to this character. And so he starts this crazy experiment to have his white buddy buy him as a slave, right? And, of course, it starts off as as kind of a joke, right? But the... The, the the black character is heavily invested in having this experience happen. This is a dark comedy, right? I mean, it appears to be a dark comedy at first. As the play goes on, things get crazy. Um, the plot gets more and more twisted. And in the end, like no spoiler alert, it ends in violence between uh, the black male and the, the white male. Not surprisingly. Um, and it exposes a lot of the racism that is kind of just invoked in our language and how we just talk to each other. And why I wanted to talk about this is because during the play, there is a lot... Of, it's, again, it's a dark comedy, and there's a lot of extremely uncomfortable moments that are almost on the brink of absurd... And that kind of 
provoke, provoked a laughter, at least on this occasion, provoked a laughter from the audience. Again, Berkeley, primarily a white audience, because, you know, we're at a play. Um, and I didn't think much of that until I stayed for the Q&A. And there was this one the Q&A with the actors and the director who came out and they were, you know, exhausted after this, this show, because it was, I guess, super draining for them. Um, and there was one black woman in the audience who asked a question and he was just extremely disturbed. And what she basically said was like, I was personally extremely taken aback by the amount of laughter that was happening at these really damaging moments. Um, and I was like, well, well, I mean, it's a play. It's a, I mean, it's a comedy, right? I mean, it's a dark comedy. Like what? I mean, there's, of course, people are just laughing because they're uncomfortable. But the conversation continued, and no, I mean, the point that was brought up is that this is a play that kind of shines a light on you and forces you to look in the mirror at your own prejudices that you, that one might perpetrate their daily lives. So um, we left the, we left the show, and, you know, I was talking with my mom, and I was very unsettled by the whole experience. And I don't think it was because of the play itself, but that comment that that, that girl had made. Um, because she was completely right. And I was like, well, why was, well, why was I laughing at that stuff? That's not funny. Like, if, if those had been Asian people out there, Chinese people... <laughs> The character, if the if the character being degraded had been Chinese, would I have been laughing? No, I would have been pissed, probably, and even more unsettled. Um, I digress. What I'm trying to illustrate is that it's 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 difficult to hear that you have been complicit in racism and in violence. It's it's not a conversation that you want to have, especially coming from my background, being from Berkeley, having these liberal ideals, you know, saying, you know, I'm not a racist. Um, and saying, you know, that's enough. I'm not a racist. That's enough. No, it's not enough. Clearly it's not enough because I think the events, I mean, all of them, all of the, the murders that we've seen and not seen are systemic and, are consequent of inaction on the part of people who could do something. People like me, people like, you know, the people listening to this, this episode. Um, so what do I want to do today? I want to talk more. I want to talk about structural racism because I think that a lot of the conversations, hopefully, um, in the next few weeks, we'll discuss that and shift really because, you know, that's kind of the problem, right? Because a lot of people are struggling to understand the difference between racism at an individual level and racism at a systemic level, um, at an institutional level, excuse me. Um, you know, people who, people who, who you seeing on social media who saying, well, I'm not racist and you know, it, you know, um, my family is not racist. And so what's the problem? That's, I mean, that's clearly not enough. Racism is at its most dangerous at an institutional level when it allows constant violence and degradation of a certain, a certain minority group like we've seen. So I want, I'm, I'm hoping that in the next few weeks, those conversations continue to happen and that we continue to I guess, expose structural racism where it exists and it's everywhere, right? Because you can look at any, any institution and see, well, I guess most institutions, I guess, and see these things. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was, is how alcohol, right? Because this is a podcast about alcohol, um, how it affects the African-American community. And I just basically started researching a few nights ago and I just basically off of a, this is basically just off of a few hours of research, but I found some interesting things that I think are worth talking about. So 
Um, with that said, let's get into it. Welcome to Stone Cold Moderation, a thinking man's journey toward a healthier relationship with alcohol. I'm your host, Chase Lee. Let's continue with our discussion. First and foremost, before I proceed, uh, I want to correct myself from a statement I said earlier. Yeah, the play White Noise that I saw, um, I was characterizing it as a dark comedy. Um, Yeah, I think I was just projecting that onto it and wishing that it was a a dark comedy. There was nothing actually funny about it. I think I just arrived that night at the theater expecting it to be a dark comedy. Was not. But nevertheless, it was really powerful and like I said deeply unsettling and I would recommend it if you ever get the chance to see it and if you know theater comes back things like that um okay I digress let's 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 get into it uh what did I find in the brief research studying this topic um first article that I read called Less Drinking Yet More Problems, Understanding African-American in Drinking and Related Problems. Leader re- researcher on this article was Tamika Zapolsky. Found that blacks experience later initiation to alcohol, right? And report lower levels of use over lifetime than, for example, national averages and their white counterparts. Uh, they blacks fall below national averages in binge drinking and underage drinking, right? Why? Um, the article points to religion and cultural norms taking place in African American communities that deter people from drinking earlier and drinking more and drinking more frequently. Um, and I thought that was interesting because that's something, I guess, anecdotally that I could attest to. Not to say that I have drank with black people on many occasions, but I do remember from high school on occasions where I was around black people at parties or if I was at a party at a black person's house in a black neighborhood, so to speak, um, I always noticed that they drank a lot less than the white kids, right? Um, That they're always more under control when it came to the alcohol consumption. And it's something that we joked about at the time. But uh, yeah, anecdotally, I guess, I guess I could attest to that. I'm not a a great person to make that, to make that claim, but reading this research kind of, uh, kind of took me back to memories of Berkeley high. Anywho. Blacks are more likely, according to the study, to report alcohol-related illness and injury, more likely to report alcohol dependence, and most at risk to face problematic drinking. The article points to the fact that low-income black men are especially at risk for problematic drinking because they may have less access to quote-unquote positive life influences, that might deter, keep them from drinking, such as a steady job and support systems in place. And the finding that was most alarming was that blacks are more likely to experience negative social consequences due to drinking, for example, or at least perceived social consequences due to drinking. Um, For example, getting in trouble with the cops um having your a family fall apart because of drinking blacks have reported being at higher risk for that negative things happening socially to them because of alcohol 
So what does this all mean? I mean, how can we sort of unpack this? Um, first of all, I definitely think it speaks to socioeconomic differences between blacks and whites. Um, you know, black people drink less, but experience more health problems related to alcohol. And we've seen, you know, COVID-19 has perfectly illuminated the fact that uh, black communities are less healthy than white communities. Um, and I guess alcohol has a similar effect. Um, the level of general health is lower, so alcohol can do more damage. Um, but I also think that these findings kind of illuminate not just social inequality, but white privilege and systemic racism. Um in a number of ways. And I mean, just, just thinking about it in simpler terms. I mean, white people can drink way more than black people and less bad shit happens to them <laughs> in terms of their health, mental health, um, their standing in society. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's pretty alarming, although not, not entirely surprising. It kind of, and it reminds me again of this play. I keep going back to it. This play, White Noise. Um, in it, the the two the two female characters. Again, one is white, one is black, and basically the 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 the, the white woman, she ends up sleeping, kind of sleeping around, okay, and eventually, her she and the the black character, the black woman, they get into a conversation about it where the black girl starts talking about, you know, I can't, I can't do that, right? If I behave badly in such a way, there will be incredible consequences against me. I can't just do what you do and get away with it. And it kind of seems like alcohol, which is also can be described as an indulgence, maybe functions similarly to, I guess, sex in this case, in the case of the play, right? Um, Quite possibly, I'm, I'm reaching for that connection, but it kind of rang a bell for me. Okay, moving along. Second topic that I read about, closely related, so that liquor stores more likely are more... No, excuse me. A higher concentration of liquor stores are found in primarily black neighborhoods. Um, this was I read about this first in a from a Boston Globe article which was from 2008 by Tanya de Zuluriaga entitled alcohol more available in poor black areas and it alluded to a scholarly work done by Rhonda Jones Webb who published a scholarly work called alcohol and malt liquor availability and promotion and homicide in inner cities Okay, um, you can find these resources on the show notes of this episode. And again, um, her study, Ms. Jones Webb study concluded that neighborhoods with high concentration of blacks would equal higher concentration of liquor stores. And again, anecdotally, that's not terribly surprising. Um, I haven't spent too, too much time in primarily black neighborhoods. Um... But I can you, you can attest to the fact that if you go into the inner city neighborhoods, it's like there's a there's a fucking liquor store in every corner, right? That's what the study showed. Um, and in this Boston Globe article, actually, Rhonda Jones Webb, the lead investigator, said that her findings weren't all her <clears throat> weren't all that um, weren't all that surprising. But this was the first time that a study had been basically done about it, right? Connection to film, anecdote, um, segue. Um, John Singleton's 1990 film, uh, Boys in the Hood. If you haven't seen that, I definitely recommend that too. Um, Lawrence Fishburne, his character, who is the dad of one of the main characters, the dad of the main character, excuse me, um, who's this very like eloquent, well-spoken 
um, highly educated man living in this, um, you know, this black inner city neighborhood. And there's a scene where he basically is on the street corner talking to some people and pointing out that, you know, why is there a liquor store and a gun store in every single corner? And that's something that I feel like is spoken a lot about in, in hip hop lyrics too. Right. I could be wrong about that, but anywho. Um, so Lawrence Fisher character points that out in this scene. And that always kind of stuck with me. Um, and again, I think as the, the researcher described in that, in that article, um, not entirely surprising her findings. Another thing that this Boston Globe article did say, however, was that applications for new stores are reviewed by state and local agencies before being approved, which unfortunately to me, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, seems to be a red flag of systemic racism. Why do they need to put a liquor store, many liquor stores in neighborhoods where they know that it does more damage? And I'm sure that the argument could be made that capitalist society, the market decides what is going to go where and who's going to consume who, but that seems awfully sketchy to me. I could be wrong. If I am, please uh, hit me up and correct me. Okay. So, um, again, that is the research that I did in just a few hours. And my goal is to have somebody on this program at a later date who really knows what they're talking about, who I can speak with. But I guess just to sum it up, um, for me, these findings, these findings really illustrate the social socioeconomic gaps between blacks and whites. Um, yeah, but, but also systemic racism and white privilege. I mean, what I didn't talk about was also um, what I didn't expand upon was the negative social consequences due to drinking. In the first article I was talking about, it mentioned higher police presence and because, because there's a higher police presence presence in black neighborhoods and how that could relate to the consumption of alcohol, right? Um, black people, I guess, don't want to drink as much because it's more dangerous for them to drink where they live because there's police everywhere. That's an example of the negative social consequence that this article was referring to. And unfortunately, that's exactly what we saw with George Floyd. He, I'm not completely 100% sure about this, but I do believe he was described as being intoxicated when he was murdered. And we certainly can't speculate on what would have happened if George Floyd hadn't been intoxicated at that moment. Um, I think his, you know, his murder had more to do with the fact that he was apprehended by a racist, psychotic, murderous police officer. But I think this... I I think that what happened to him is a perfect example of the negative, yeah, the negative social consequences that that this article was talking about. That blacks just don't feel safe drinking more because apparently they're aware that more bad stuff can happen to them when they do drink, and that's pretty horrifying. While on the other hand, um, their white counterparts can drink more, drink more frequently, drink more heavily, start at a younger age but experience less negative consequences all across the, the spectrum of negative consequences. If that doesn't speak to white privilege, I don't know what does. So I hope that was informative. Um, perhaps my analysis was a bit clunky, but I do promise to try to get somebody on this show at a later date who knows more than me and who can really share their expertise. Um, 
But what I'm trying to illuminate and trying to emphasize is the importance of identifying systemic racism. Because, you know, for example, what I'm seeing a lot on social media the today, right, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the protests are, mm, among other things, you know, like videos of police officers kneeling with protesters, right? Um, as kind of a, a show of solidarity, for example. And I mean, for me, that's just lip service, honestly. I, I think it's very ca cathartic, right? And it's fun for people to, to share and it's, it's emotional. But that, that really doesn't mean anything, right? Because if you can have, you can have many good cops and of course there's good cops, right? Not to go off on a rant. I mean, of course there's, of, of course in any department, there's going to be any number of good cops and there's going to be an, a number of bad cops too. But the, the important thing is if these systems and these institutions are allowed to be racist and, and allowed to enable violence against black people, we're going to continue to get the same results. And I think the racism that exists in these institutions is as sinister as what we observed in the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I truly believe that. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not buying into the, the cops kneeling with the protesters at, at rallies. I think it's cathartic, but I think it's, I think it's empty and I think it's, it's lip service. And I mean, as um, I had another friend on social media point out, you know, what, what have those cops done to patrol their own unit and to strike out racism in their own department? Um, possibly nothing, right? Because again, uh, I think a part of these, the culture of police culture in this country is if you go against the grain, you get, you get, you get knocked down. And if you try to expose um, negative aspects of different police departments, they throw you out. They protect their own. I'm going off on a rant right now. I'm sorry. But what I what I wanted to at least start with 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 this part of the podcast is to highlight systemic racism um, as it results to as it relates to alcohol um, as we move forward and hopefully bringing to light institutionalized racism in in other parts of society in, in all its forms because it really is everywhere. Okay, um, final thoughts here. Um, I'd like to conclude this episode by telling the recounting the story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a young African American boy um, who was from Chicago. And in the summer of 1955, 65 years ago, he was visiting family in the town of Money, Mississippi. At the time, he was 14 years old. Um, one summer afternoon, he was standing outside of a convenience store, and a white woman walked out of the store. Allegedly, according to witnesses, Emmett Till said her way by baby and that was it four days later on the evening of august 28th excuse me i think in the the wee hours of the morning august 28th two white men um one the husband of the white woman in question who Emmett Till spoke to briefly four days earlier, um, showed up at the house he was staying. He was staying with cousins. 
and demanded to see Emmett Till. Eventually got him outside, put him in a car, and after some time ended up at the edge of a river where he was brutally beaten, had his eyes gouged out, and was eventually shot in the head and then thrown into the river. Um, his body was found sometime later and taken back to Chicago. Famously for the funeral, his mother elected to have him lay in an open casket because she wanted the world to see what had happened to her child, who was 14. The photos of Emmett Till, Emmett Till's open casket, um, quickly circled the country and caused quite a stir and an uproar. And it was seen as a wake-up moment for the country and provided some of the impetus that eventually led to the civil rights movement. And again, historically is kind of seen as a wake-up a wake up moment for many in the country as personally ashamed of as personally as ashamed as as I am to say I I hope that the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent protests will be a wake up moment for me and for others who haven't done shit because what happened to Emmett Till was 65 years ago, and they're still killing black people in the street with impunity. We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile. And mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise In counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us While we wear the mask. We smile but, O oh great Christ, our cries To thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet, and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. This has been the Stone Cold Moderation Podcast with Chase Lee. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out the complete show notes of this episode on stonecoldmoderation.com, where you can learn more about us. For access to more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channels and check us out on all other social media platforms.